to for a few moments tonight for our study this evening. We want to talk about working out our salvation. Everybody say that with me. Working out our salvations. Now, let me, before we even begin to read our scripture text, let me just make something abundantly clear uh, before we go into this lesson tonight. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? Uh, it is the free gift of God. Our salvation is not because of our works. This is something we must have a firm grip, grasp on, a firm uh, understanding of. You can be so holy. You can make sure you never say a foul word or a negative word. You can dress holy. You can live holy. You can do everything you want to treat everybody correctly. You can be the most perfect person who ever walked on the face of the earth. But your perfection is not enough to pay for your, sinlessness, your sinful nature. And it takes the blood of Jesus Christ to save us. This is not something that we don't know. I'm, I'm saying something very fundamental, very basic here. But I want you to understand that all of our righteousness is as what? Filthy rags in the sight of God. It's not of, it's of, but now does that mean that God doesn't expect us to be righteous? You have to put that in context. In context, what that scripture is saying is that when we try to take our righteousness and accomplish salvation through our righteousness, it is nothing but worthless, filthy rags. Because the righteousness that we have comes through Jesus Christ. The salvation that we have comes through Jesus Christ. So we want to settle that issue before we go any further, lest anyone should have any kind of misunderstanding tonight that we are working. We didn't say working for our salvation. We said working out our salvation. Okay, there is a difference. We're not working for salvation. We're not doing righteous deeds to save us, we are doing righteous deeds because we are saved. We are not living holy lives to earn our salvation. We are living holy lives because our holy God has saved us and asked us to live holy unto him. So those are simple and yet very profound, fundamental principles of the word of God that we must have very firmly in our understanding, especially tonight, as we go through this lesson on working out our salvation, because we don't want to get the misunderstanding in this, in this study tonight that salvation is something that we accomplish through our efforts or that we accomplish through our works, okay? So we understand that salvation is a gift of God. We receive it by grace. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So we want to talk about what what the apostle tells the church at Philippi concerning working out salvation. Philippians chapter 2, we want to read verses 2 through 16. The apostle says this, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absent, absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, Notice here that the first thing the apostle does is he compliments the church at Philippi for what? For their obedience. He says, you are obedient unto me and unto the word of God when I am present with you, but you're also obedient to me and to the word of God even in my absence. But he tags on to this concept of obedience. He says, therefore, or now there, work out your own salvation with fear and with trembling. Verse 13, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Uh, notice that the scripture says not to will and to do of our own pleasure, but his own pleasure. I've said this before, I'll say it again, uh, I'm sure many times, but when I, was, when I was 12 years old, I got the Holy Ghost and got baptized in Jesus' name. Now I was raised in a pastor's home you would think that I would have gotten the Holy Ghost long before that because some children raised in an apostolic home, a Pentecostal home, they'll get the Holy Ghost at five years of age, six years of age, seven, eight. I guess I was stubborn. I don't know. I always loved the Lord. I always wanted to 
go to church. I never in my life, I thank the Lord, I never in my life didn't want to serve the Lord. Never. Even before I got the Holy Ghost. I never wanted to be, there were moments when I wanted to go my direction, but I didn't want to stop serving the Lord. I didn't want to just cast aside everything. But I received the Holy Ghost when I was 12, got baptized when I was 12. And uh, of course I had tried to live a Christian life even before I got the Holy, tr- Holy Ghost, tried to live a good life. But it was, I was 17 when I actually gave my life to Jesus Christ. Okay, now, uh, I'm not saying that in the context, context that um, denominational Christians will say that, say that. They'll say, well, when I was 15, I got saved and gave my life to Christ. Okay, they'll make that statement. When I, got, when I was 15 or whatever age, I got saved and I gave my life to Christ. Well, um, that, that is not what I'm saying. I, I received the Holy Ghost at 12, got baptized at 12, but I really didn't surrender my life Understand what I'm talking about? I didn't really say, God, you can have all of me until I was 17. And I wrestled with God for a long time about this. But at at the age of 17, I said, okay, Lord, you got me. Whatever you want, I'll do. Whatever you say, I'll do. You got me. Now, here's the point. We tell the Lord that we give him our life. But then our our tendency is to walk away from the altar and then spin around and pick up that life again and say, okay, now I'm going to live, you know, live my way. You see, when you give something away, when you give someone a gift, you don't have the right to tell them how to use the gift. Now, you'll have some people who will try to tell you how to use the gift, you know. But really, in the, in the true sense, when you give something to somebody, you relinquish your rights, your authority, your ownership. It's not yours anymore. I give it to you. If I give my wallet, <laughs> he is still not a rich man. Okay? But right now, I can claim that, but I gave it to him until he gives it back to me. Thank thank you, Jesus. He's a good man. You know, when, when you give something away, it becomes the property of the person to whom you give it. They have the right of how to use it. Now, in the context of giving our life to Jesus Christ, when we give him our life, we have to give it to him to do with, according to his pleasure not our pleasure now um, and this is not the subject matter the subject point tonight that we want to get into but I just want to make this point very clear when you give your life to Jesus Christ you give him your dreams oh it's getting quiet now when you give your life to Jesus Christ you give him your plans your agenda for the future When you give your life to Jesus Christ, you say, Lord, here's my life. I was going to be an astrophysicist. Not really. I was going to be a lawyer. I was going to be, you know, a doctor. I was going to be a business person. I was going to be a school teacher. But when you give your life to Jesus Christ, you have to say, Lord, here's my life. You can use it as you want. You tell me how you want me to use this life that I have given to you. And so really, when you come to Jesus Christ and and you give him your life, it's all about his pleasure and his purpose and his plan. And let me tell you something. God has a better plan for your life than you will ever have for your own life. And that's why I tell parents repeatedly, don't tell your children they can be anything they want to be. Wrong. They can be anything God wants them to be. When you tell them that, it puts in the proper context. It empowers them to become, but it empowers them to become what God wants them to do and to be. So we see here, he says, 
God works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure, not our good pleasure. Verse 14, do all things without murmurings and disputings. 15, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke. Praise God. The sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. This is Paul speaking now to the church in Philippi. He says, I want to rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. He said, Philippians, I'm telling all of this to you because there's a day of accounting coming. When that accounting day comes, I want to make sure that I have not labored in vain with you and that your work is not in vain as well. So Paul says here that we are to work out our own salvation with fear and with trembling. The word that is translated as work out in the English language comes from the Greek word katergazomai, which means to work on to finish, to fully accomplish, to complete, to conclude. It refers to a work that has already begun but is continuing in process. So when Paul tells the church at Philippi to work out their salvation, he is telling them to fully accomplish it, to complete it, to continue it, to work on it, to finish it, to, to help the process of what God has begun in their lives. So what the Apostle Paul is saying here in a nutshell, I guess, would be don't go halfway with God, go all the way. The point is not just starting, the point is crossing the finish line. I have come too far not to make it to the end now. I don't know how you feel about it. But I have fought too many battles. I have won too many victories. I have slain too many dragons. I have fought too many devils. And I have had too many glorious miracles happen in my life for me not to cross the finish line now. I intend to step over that line one of these days. That's the point. That's the goal. It's not just about right now. It's not just about what is happening in my life now. My goal, my objective is to step over that finish line. That's the goal. So Paul is saying, you know, finish it, work it out. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It reminds me of something Paul said to the church in Galatia. He gave them a very heartbreaking rebuke in Galatians chapter 5, verse 7. He says this, ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? What a tragedy. Now, understand here, Paul is talking to Holy Ghost filled, Jesus name baptized believers in the city of Galatia. He's not talking to unbelievers, he's talking to saints. He's talking to Bethel. You did run well. What did hinder? Who did hinder you? What did hinder you? You know, the devil studies us. The devil knows our weak points. He knows our structural weaknesses. And he attacks us. Where does the enemy attack? At your weakest point. Therefore, we have to, to make sure that we protect ourselves and guard ourselves and, 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 and make sure that we are protected and strong in the weak areas of our life. The apostle said, you started so well, but it's not the one who starts that gets the crown. It's the one that finishes the race. Praise God. That's why I say I really like people who've been serving the Lord for a long, long time. I love the young people. Oh, I love them so much. They're, they're my joy. They're my hope. They're the future. You know, they just about killed me in Costa Rica because they were so energetic and lively and running. And, you know, i trying to keep up with them. Uh, you know, it, with them it's always, you know, and then the next thing out of their mouth is, I'm exhausted. And I'm like, you're 21. You don't know what exhausted means yet. 
You wait till you're 41, 51, 61. Then we'll talk about being, but you know what I'm talking about. Young people, they just crash. Then they get up and go again. And so and I love, love young people so much. They're, they're the, the, the joy, the strength of the church. There's, but when I see people, and I don't want to say old people because there can be some younger and middle-aged people who've been in the Lord a long time. You know, they got some scars. They got some, they might limp a little bit because they've been through some battles. But you know what? It, it, it makes me so it makes me so encouraged because if my dad can make it, I can make it. If my brother can make it, I can make it. If my sister can make it, I can make it. If anybody else can make it, I can make it. <laughs> Praise God. And so we have to work out our salvation, and that is what we are in the process of doing now in this daily life that we live. We are working out our salvation, working out the details of how the salvation that God has placed within us and this becoming more like him, uh, our metamorphosis that we are changing daily to become more like him. We are working out how that process is taking place in our life. We have a role, we have a part we have a job to do in our, in our salvation and in continuing and completing this work that has happened in us through the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter said on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, verse 40, he said, the, word, the Bible says, and with many other words he, did he, Peter, testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Of course, he was encouraging them and talking to them about repenting and being baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ and receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But he shows here that there is a process, there is a responsibility that falls on us to be active participants in this act of salvation. We are not passive in the process of salvation. We are active in the process of salvation. First... We must receive him as redeemer and savior. Is there anybody here tonight that's received him as redeemer and savior? He is your savior. He has redeemed you. But then secondly, we must accept him as Lord and master. That's a whole different ball of wax, as they say. You can be saved and not be submitted to the lordship of Jesus Christ. However, I will, I will submit to you that if you continue to reject the lordship of Jesus Christ, your salvation will come in jeopardy at some point because you cannot please God through disobedience. At some point, you must become obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. So we must submit to him not only as master or not only as savior and as redeemer but we must also submit to him as lord and master and god expects us to actively participate in this transformation of our character he says in philippians 2 12 work out your own salvation with fear and trembling everybody say fear and trembling fear. now this is really interesting because it's not just fear okay if it said work out your salvation with fear we would all be tempted to translate that as awe, okay? The awe of God. But then what's this next word he adds? Trembling. What, what causes trembling? Fear, okay? Uh, when you are very afraid, you tremble. And when you research this scripture, you will find that he, it is literally speaking of trembling before the Lord. Now, we're told in scripture not to be afraid. We know that. Fear not is always the first thing that comes out of the angel's mouth. The Lord told Joshua, fear not, I will be with thee. The Lord, someone has said that there are 365 fear nots in the Bible. I've never read, I never counted them, but someone has said that there are 365 fear nots in the Bible. That's one for every day of the year, which is fine with me. I don't doubt that a bit. So we know that we are not to fear in the sense, we are not to fear what man can do unto us. We are not to fear the powers of darkness. Hello? We're not to fear situations in our life. We're not to fear, fear the political situation, the, the socioeconomic situation in our world. We, we are not to fear what's going on in this world. And let me tell you something. If you don't have God, it's time to get afraid. Because this world is in serious trouble, folks. This, 
I, I'm literally, you know, living for the Lord several decades now. I, I've seen some things come and some things go, but I have never seen this country and the world race so rapidly into destruction as is happening now. It's happening before our very eyes. We're seeing our country and our world race to destruction. Just as we read in the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel, the various prophetic books, uh, Jesus speaking in Matthew and in Luke, uh, the various prophetic utterances of Jesus and various prophets, we're seeing it happen before our very eyes. So we, we could live in fear if we were to, to attach ourselves and focus and obsess on the things that are happening around us. I mean, we need a president. I'm not going to go there because I don't know what we're going to get. Okay? We need an economic policy. I'm not going to go there. I don't know what we're going to get. This world, this world's in trouble, but God's in control. Let me tell you something. <laughs> Sister Fotine, turn off the tape, turn off the recorder. For they will have that Bible study in the UN until God says it's over. Not man. When God says it's over, it's over. I just want you to understand there's nothing to fear in this world. Okay? That doesn't mean we're not going to face persecution. That doesn't mean we're not going to face hardship. That doesn't mean that people aren't going to hate us for his namesake. Weren't they hated for his namesake in the first century church? Are we better than they? We, we are so blessed. We go home and cry our eyes out when somebody calls us a holy roller religious fanatic at work. We're so offended and so hurt. You know, Oh, my! I'm just bearing a cross. Someone called me a holy roller. Did they beat you? Did they take your job? Did they take your family? Did they take your home? Did they throw you in prison? No, but I have such a cross to... See what I'm saying? Things may come. Things may come. I, 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 all I know is this. God has it all in control. Nobody can touch you till God says they can touch you. Nobody can lay a finger on you till God says they can lay a finger on you. And if God allows it to happen, there's a purpose. If God allows you to suffer, if God allows you to be, to be harmed or to, be, to suffer persecution or to, to suffer something for the name of Jesus Christ, there's always a purpose. Brother Hernandez and I were talking about this um, also Sunday. He said, I said, can you believe how many times in Scripture, in the New Testament, persecution and joy go together in the same verse? Persecution and rejoice. I said, it makes, to the human way of thinking, it makes no sense. But you'll find they rejoice that they were worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. You know, we, we are told not to fear anything in this world, but there is one thing that we are to fear. And we are to fear God. The Bible says, don't fear the man, the man that can destroy your body, but fear the one that can destroy your body and your soul and cast you into the lake of fire. That's the person we are to fear. And so we, there is a, an injunction in both the Old and New Testaments that tell us we should fear the Lord. Now, I'm, I'll be the first to tell you that in many cases and in, in many uh, instances, that word fear can be can be defined or described as having great awe, great respect, great reverence for God, revering him and fearing him. But, and I've done a study on this, and I've taught a Bible lesson on this, and I may have to dig it up in a few months and teach it again, but there is an aspect to the fear of the Lord that means fear. That means fear. America, the world, has lost its fear of God. And that's, to a great degree, a major part of the problem is that people no longer fear God. Now, let me just tell you something. If, if the sky were to unfold right now and we were to see just a fraction of God's glory, you would not be standing clapping. You would be diving under the pew. God, help us, help us, help us. Because flesh, flesh 
is so insignificant and filthy and unworthy when compared to the majesty and the glory of God. We cannot exalt ourselves. We can hardly even give him praise. Isaiah said, I'm a man of unclean lips. How can I stand in the presence of an almighty God? Because when you recognize his glory, his greatness, his awesomeness, you stand with fear and trembling, knowing the majesty and the power of this God. We often think of fear as a negative force. We think of fear as a negative force, but scripture teaches, especially the book of Proverbs, teaches us that fear can be a positive force as well. Proverbs 1, 7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs 8, 13 says, the fear of the Lord will cause one to hate evil. Proverbs 10, 27 says, the fear of the Lord will prolong life. Proverbs 14, 26 through 27 says the fear of the Lord provides strong confidence and is a fountain of life. Proverbs 16, 16, the fear of the Lord prompts one to depart from evil. Proverbs 19, 23, the fear of the Lord leads to a satisfying life and spares one from much evil. And Proverbs 22, 4 says the fear of the Lord is the way to riches, honor, and life. There's something positive about fearing the Lord. Can I get an amen? amen? There's something powerful about fearing the Lord. Isaiah 8, 13 says, Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. And that word dread means to shake terribly. Okay. Now, we, we're a little uncomfortable with this because we we have a, a greater understanding of the majesty of, of, of who our Jesus is, and we, we know him as a personal Savior. We know him as our Redeemer. We know him as someone that we truly want to wrap our arms around, and some way we want him to wrap his arms around us. But I will, I will call to your attention that the disciples that went with Jesus to the Mount of Transfiguration Okay, they knew this Jesus. They had been walking with him for years. They heard him teach and preach. But on the Mount of Transfiguration, they saw a different Jesus than they'd ever seen before. You hear what I'm saying? His hair became white as snow. His eyes were like burning coal. His raiment was glistening white. His hands and feet were like bronze. You hear what I'm saying? They, were, they saw a different Jesus, the same Jesus, but they saw a different aspect of this Jesus. He's not just flesh like you and me. There's an aspect of this Jesus that is awesome, fearful when we understand the majesty and our, our, our finite mind, our human mind is, is overwhelmed by the majesty, the power, and the magnitude of this great God that we serve. And so it causes us to, to have a, a healthy fear of him in the sense that we walk in his ways and try to please him. 2 Corinthians 5.11 says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. The apostle said there is a terror of the Lord. There's... Uh, you know, and I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to make anyone afraid of the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. But what I'm trying to say is he's more than just your buddy. He's more than someone you can go into your prayer closet and complain to. Okay? We know him on that level. And we're very comfortable with making him, you know. And that's fine, that's, that's fine. But the point is, you need to understand who this Jesus is that you're talking to. This is not some Joe from next door. This is the creator of the universe. This is the one who spoke into nothingness and it became. He's awesome. Yes, he loves us, but he is an awesome God. And we need to retain a healthy respect for who he actually is. We need to fear and tremble lest we fail the Lord. Now, he goes on to say, we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. He says, because it is God within us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now, God will never ask us to do something that we cannot do. Okay? I want want to denounce a lie of the devil tonight 
it's not too hard to serve God. It's not more than you can do to serve God. It's not too much for you. I renounce the devil's lie when he comes to you and says, you don't have what it takes. You can't make it. You're not strong enough. This is too hard. Nobody can do this. This is beyond human, comp, uh, uh, you know, human ability. This is too much. That's a lie from the pit of hell. God will never ask his people to do something that is beyond their ability to do. If God has asked us, he will enable us to do what he has asked us to do. Otherwise, he would be an unjust God. And he is not a just God. So Paul lets us to know that we're not left on our own with our own carnal resources in regard to working out our salvation. He said, it is God. Everybody say God. God. Who works where? Where? In you. Both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That word worketh actually is from a Greek word that means energize. God energizes us. He gives us the energy. He gives us the power. He gives us the ability. He gives us the resources to do what he has asked us to do. First, the Spirit of God will give you the will to obey God. This will, our will involves our desire and our motivation. You remember Brother Alan Oggs who preached here a few times and wrote the book and preached the great sermon. You've got to have the, the want to. That was his, his book and it was a great book. It may be titled, You Gotta Have the Want To or You Have to Have the Want To, something like that. Uh, you gotta have the want to. You've got to have a desire to serve God. You've gotta have a desire to please God. This, this involves our will. It, is, it involves our desires. Now, here's the point. We've already, we've already said this. Look at this. It is what? It is who? It is God. Who does what? He works. Where? In you. To do what? To give us the will and to give us the power. To give us to be able to, to will to do it and to do it in, in effect. He gives it. How does that happen? It is God. It is God that gives us. The, God can change your will. God can give you the want to. When the Holy Ghost only has a little influence in your life, then your ability to obey God is going to be weak. Now, let me just say something. You watch TV for hours a day. You listen to the radio. You talk to your worldly co-workers you listen to the ungodly news that's enough to make you depressed right there okay and and then you read the bible for 15 minutes a day okay. i'm not saying you have to read the bible for hours a day but here's the point it's like the old indian said he said there's two dogs that live on the inside of me there's a good dog and a bad dog, and they always fight. And the little boy said, which one wins? And he said, the one I feed the most. Whichever one I feed the most is going to have this. Let me tell you something. Do you ever wish the pastor would stop telling you it's important for you to come to church? Don't you wish the preachers would stop telling you it's important for you to read your Bible? It's the same old thing. I wish he'd stop telling us we need to fast. I wish he'd stop telling us that we need to pray. I wish he'd stop making such a thing about, uh, such a deal about coming to church and, and being involved in everything. You know why we do that? Because you, your spiritual man needs to be fed. He cannot survive on one meal a week. The world is pumping its evil perverseness into your mind and heart and spirit every day. Yes. You can't go anywhere without hearing vile language, yes. pitiful, pitiful words and pitiful thoughts and, and perverse ideas. You can't go shopping without seeing things you shouldn't see. 
Your mind is constantly bombarded by this. Your, your mind is constantly tempted to the things of the world, and you're constantly being tempted to think like the world thinks, talk like the world talk, act like the world acts. You're constantly being influenced by the world. And so it's feeding your human carnal nature all the time. Therefore, you know, that's why we say you got to be in the house of the Lord. you got to read. You say, oh, I don't want, you know what, even if you just, you know what, even if you just read a few minutes a day, you got to read the word. I said, you got to read the word. God wants to talk to you. God wants to speak to you. God wants to feed you. I have never met any Christian who is consistent in prayer, consistent in Bible study, and consistent in faithfulness to the house of God that has difficulty living for the Lord. Every time I talk to somebody that is having problems and they, they're really struggling with living for God, how's your prayer life? Well, I don't, well, I just don't feel like praying. You know, you know why you don't feel like praying? Because you don't pray. Let me give you a hint. When you don't feel like praying, pray anyway. Because chances are, if you'll pray and pray and just keep on praying for a little bit, you'll start to feel like praying. And when you start to feel like praying, you'll make a connection with God. And when you can make a connection with God, you'll begin to receive strength and you'll begin to receive encouragement and you'll begin to receive power that you need to live. Sometimes, you know, we, we talk about not living by our feelings, but we're so prone to live by our feelings. We need to, we need, need to be regimented in taking care of the spiritual man. You know, I, don't, I doubt very many of us missed a meal today. And if we did miss a meal, we made up for it the second time around. I guarantee, right? If we missed one meal, next time, oh, I missed lunch. Here we go. You know, we're going we're gonna to stoke it in for extra, you know. In the word of, we've got to feed our, that's why the inner man must be kept strong. We, we do these because when the spirit is strong in us, then our will to please God is strong. Why? Because God is working within us. And when God works within us, he gives us that will. The more you pray, the more you want to pray. The more you're faithful to the house of God, the more you want to be faithful to the house of God. The more you study his word, the more you want to study his word because it creates a, 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 a great circle of power within your life because you stir up the spirit and you allow God to work within you. And when God works within you, he gives you the will and he gives you the power to do what he has asked you to do. Praise God. Would you say amen? amen. And secondly, the spirit will not just give you the will but also the ability the ability to do what God has asked you to do. The Bible says, ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And we're given strength. We're given the ability. We're given the power. God working within us gives us the power to do what he has at. Now, here's, here's the thing. Your walk with God depends upon your spiritual condition. All right? The influence of the Holy Ghost is critical in your life. You can be hot. You can be lukewarm. You can be cold. But here's the key. It's your choice. Okay? Now, I'm going to step out on a limb here, but I'm going to say this. It's not the church's fault. It's not your husband's fault. It's not your wife's fault. It's not the youth pastor's fault. We are responsible and accountable for our own spiritual condition. If I'm lukewarm, if I am cold, then I have made the choice to separate myself from the fire. Okay? It's our choice. And how the Holy Ghost works within us is so important. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 says, Quench not the Spirit. 
quench not the spirit. That word quench means to extinguish. You, you, you quench a thirst. You quench a fire. And the fire of the Holy Ghost can be quenched. And how does the fire of the Holy Ghost become quenched? By the works of the flesh. When you engage in the works of the flesh, you will quench the fire of the Holy Ghost. Here's the point in here that I want to make. Do not ignore the urges of the Holy Ghost that God speaks to you in your heart. Okay? When God speaks, listen. Now, I want to tell you something. Yes, God will tell you from time to time, go pray for this person and go witness to that person. And when God speaks, you should do it. <clears throat> I believe maybe, maybe it was Brother Hernandez or someone Sunday that said something to that effect. When God speaks, go minister, go do this, you should. But here's the thing. A lot of times God doesn't tell us to go lay hands on somebody for a miracle. Here's what God will say. Stop doing that. Did you hear me? Stop doing that. That's not what we really want to hear. We want to go, Lord, lead me to pray for somebody to get a miracle. Oh, Lord, I can't wait to get to church next Sunday and tell everybody that I prayed for somebody with a headache and they got healed at Walmart. Why? Because that really lifts up. Oh, okay. That's what we want God to tell us. But what God most, more often than not says, stop going there. Here's what God says. Go pray. Here's what God says. Fast today. Those are not the things, oh, that must have been me. No, your flesh is not telling you to fast. I promise you 100%. Your flesh did not come up with that idea, okay? That was God that telling you to go fast. Wake up in the middle of the night, can't sleep, and, the, and you, you feel it. Go pray. Oh, this bed feels, suddenly so, the bed feels so good. God says, go in the living room and pray. Here, the point I'm trying to make, don't quench the spirit when it speaks to you because when you begin to follow the leading of the spirit, you begin to create a fire in your life that gives you power with God that you will receive no other way. And every time, every time God says, stop doing that, and you just, ah, no, it wasn't God. God said, stop going there. That, that wasn't God. You need to stop that friendship with that person, that person, I don't, I'm not talking to him, okay, I'm talking to us in general, okay, break off that relationship, stop that friendship with that person, because they're a negative influence on you, and they're not receiving, they're causing damage rather than, and every time that we ignore the voice of God, it's just the spirit of God, it's just as if we have gotten a fire extinguisher, and sprayed the extinguishing liquid on the fire. And you know, if we don't listen to God enough, he will eventually stop talking. I've had people tell me, well, I used to hear from God. I don't hear from God anymore. One of the reasons you might not have heard from God lately is because you haven't been doing what he was telling you to do when he talked to you before. I want to have the Spirit of God so stirred up within me. I want to be so on fire for God that I have a will and a passion to live for Him, to do the will of God, and to have the ability to do what He has asked me to do that will only come if I walk in the fervency of the Spirit of God. And as, as children of God, that is what He has called us to do. We must take heed to do what the Spirit has told us to do. Would you say amen? We, and I'm going I'm to save the rest of this lesson for another time because there's several more pages and we don't have time to finish it all tonight. But let me just say this. When we learn to walk in the Spirit, as we are supposed to walk in the Spirit, life becomes simple. Life becomes easy. Okay, it's, 
It's hard to live for God easy. It's easy to live for God hard. Okay, when you give it all you've got, it's not really hard to live for God. But when you're pulling back, when you're trying to live for God the way you want to live for God, it becomes very, very difficult. And let me tell you something. Church, if there was ever a time when we need to shine as never before, it is this hour. I, I feel something so strong in the Holy Ghost. I'm not just talking tonight, but in my, in my prayer time and in the last few weeks and months, I'm feeling something so strong in the Spirit that as the darkness of this world gets deeper, the light of the church is supposed to become brighter. We need to cast off. We need to cast off all the works of the flesh. We need to cast off all appearances of evil. Stop trying to be like the world. Start trying to be like Jesus. Stop trying to see how much you can look like the world. Stop trying to see how much you can act like the world. Stop trying to see how much you can slip in and be a secret Christian. It's time for the church of the living God to stand up boldly and declare who we are. Listen, there are people, there are people who are not going to be saved unless you stand up for Jesus Christ. You are the only person in their world maybe that has the Holy Ghost. And unless you stand, I'm not saying that you have to go to work tomorrow and open your Bible and start preaching at work. I'm just saying stand up and let them know who you are. Don't, when they ask, don't be afraid to tell them, I'm a Holy Ghost-filled Christian. Don't just say, I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm a Holy Ghost-filled Christian. What's, what kind of Christian is that? They just asked the right question. Now you can tell them all about it. But it's, you know, it's time for us to shine as never before. We don't need people in the church. We don't need a church that's, that you can't tell the difference from them in the world. We need the church to shine. The reason the church was so powerful in the first century was they went diametrically opposed to the culture of their day. They stood against the cultural onslaught of their day, and they let the church be their culture rather than the world be their culture. Hallelujah. And one final thing, huh? then we're going to pray and, and have a good time in the Holy Ghost tonight. I've, I've told you this before. But we keep having new converts, which is a good thing, so I'm going to tell you again. When you're a child of God, you're a Christian before anything else. I need a bigger amen than that. Amen. You're a Christian before you're Italian. Now all the Italians need to say amen. amen. You're a Christian before you're Jamaican. Amen. All right, that was the Jamaicans. <laughs> you're a Christian before you're a Haitian. Okay. You're a Christian before you're Slovak. You're a Christian before you're American. Do you hear what I'm saying? Our politics are not determined by our race or nationality. Our politics are determined by our Christian ethics and principles. We are not, we are not Italian Christians because the word Italian, whichever word is first, modifies the second word. Do you understand what I'm saying? Being an English teacher here right now. Okay, if, 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 there's, if there's such a thing as an Italian Christian, that means that they're different from a Jamaican Christian. That means their Christianity is different because you've modified it by the first word. You're not an Italian Christian, you're a Christian Italian. That's right. Which means the word Christian modifies your Italianness. Oh, yes. Which means the word Christian modifies your Jamaicanness. Which means the word Christian modifies your Americanness. Before anything else, we are chi children of God. Before anything else, we are Christian. Before anything else, we are apostolic, family of God. That's why we love one another. That's why, that's because we're one in the spirit, one in the flesh, one through the blood of Jesus Christ. And when we, here's, here's the reason I brought that up, because when we truly bind together in unity, you see, our Italianists can divide us. 
Our Jamaicanness can divide us. Our Slovakianness can divide us. Okay? But when we are Christian first, nothing can divide us. Nothing can divide us. And when we are united, the gates of hell cannot prevail against us because we are united in the spirit and the power of Almighty God. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place right now. Let's stand to our feet and worship the Lord together.